Welcome back class to the College of Mid-America World History 1. We are going to continue today with our lectures on the Greek civilization. We're going to be looking at our next civil civilization. Uh, I just wanted to uh, make a, a comment in regards to the exam. Well, first, I hope everybody had a great um, fall break. Uh, you guys are back in class. In fact, uh, I'm going to have all my students uh, doing the online class uh, for World History One uh, online this uh, uh, this week. Uh, the students in the classroom and the online students will be together online uh, because I am uh, working through a PhD seminar this week, so I'm not able to teach in class this week. So uh, online students, please welcome uh, the classroom students. Uh, because they're going to be watching this uh, online with you. Uh, also, uh, the exams. I'm hoping to have the exams that right now, this is, uh, let's see, this is Sunday that I'm doing this video. Uh, right now, I'm hoping to have the exams return to you uh, tomorrow, uh, sometime tomorrow, or even maybe Tuesday, uh, depending. Uh, the exams were kind of sporadic in regards to grades. Um, the first exam, people did a little bit better. Uh, the second exam, um, they were kind of all there. Some some did pretty well, and some didn't do so well. Uh, and I, I tried to do everything I could uh, for those in class and online to help you out as much as I can. Uh, besides, like giving you the answers, uh, even though the answers were there in um, multiple choice, uh, the correct answer is there. You just got to choose it. Uh, but with study guides, and uh, I made the video to help you guys out. Um, it's very important that uh, that uh, studying takes place. Uh, again, some of you did really well, and, and some others uh, not not as good as the first time. Uh, nobody failed, okay? So nobody failed the exam. We'll, we'll say that. Uh, so today we are going to continue now into our next civilization that we're looking at, which is the Greek civilization. And we're going to be looking at the Greeks for uh, uh, a good number of lectures here. I think it's like five maybe on the syllabus, five lectures on the syllabus and uh, we're going to go into some detail again not not great great detail because of the time period the time that we have but we are going to be going uh, into some detail with, with a few things uh, today in, in today's lecture we're going to be looking at uh, the pre-greek time period you know where did the greeks come from uh, where we're um, going to be looking at the minoan peoples and then the Mycenaean peoples and how they come together and they they make the Greek people and they develop their language one had a, a language and the other had a language and they bring their language together and gives the Greek language so we're going to be looking at at the um, pre-Greek time period then we're going to be looking at the ancient Greeks and sometimes we call that classical Greek we're going to be looking at the ancient Greeks and their development of city-states uh, called polis or this plural is polis uh, but we'll be looking at polis, and we'll look at some cities that you're probably familiar with from the New Testament, uh, Ephesus and Thessalonica. Uh, and uh, also we'll be looking at some architectural features uh, in uh, the Greek time period. And we'll be looking at that throughout uh, the, the different lectures. And then um, we're going to be looking at the, um, the Trojan War, briefly. We're going to be looking at the Trojan War as, uh, as we do touch on that. So anyway, uh, we're going to uh, move now into uh, the PowerPoint uh, part of the lecture. So uh, if you have your notebook ready, handy, or your uh, uh, Microsoft Word opened up, uh, you can just go ahead and pop that up and uh, we're going to move now into the PowerPoint lecture. Okay class, we're going to now move into our first PowerPoint uh, presentation for Ancient Greece. We're going to be looking at uh, the pre-Greek civilization and then the ancient Greek civilization today. And uh, I just want to uh, begin with uh, saying that with the invention of the plow, uh, many um, people groups around the world, they were able to move away from uh, the rivers and were able to, through irrigation and plowing of fields, they were able to uh, have civilizations uh, further away from water sources. And the Greek civilization uh, is, is the same as that. Um, the... Um, city centers, the city states, uh, they were able to um, settle away from main water sources through, and irrigation was able to then uh, irrigate their fields. So we see um, the civilizations settle in the Greek city states um, around a pretty arid region. 
And so we're going to begin with uh, the pre-Greek civilization around 2000 uh, BC. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at uh, the island of Crete. Uh, this is a focal point for us uh, to begin, the island of Crete. And there will be a map coming up where Crete is. It's in the Mediterranean Sea uh, south of uh, mainland Greece. But this is the pre-Greek civilization. And the civilization is called the Minoan civilization. It's named after the legendary king uh, Minos. And uh, this king is uh, it's legendary uh, because of the story behind it. The legend is that uh, he had the head of a, uh, the body of a man and a head of a bull, and that's called a minotaur. Uh, but um, the the king himself, uh, we we'll see a picture here just in a little bit. Uh, he he does not have that um, that head. This is just the legend uh, where basically a bull headed monster was born to Queen Pasiphae of Crete after she uh, coupled with a bull and this creature resided in a twisted maze or a labyrinth uh, where it would offer regular sacri- be offered regular sacrifices of youths and maidens to satisfy his cannibalistic hunger. Um, the beast was uh, eventually slain by the hero uh, Theseus. So obviously this is Greek mythology and um, It is connected to King Minos of uh, the island of Crete. Now, one of the things that we must understand, and you see later on in the um, Greek ruins and Greek uh, uh, buildings that have survived, is that they were great builders and they had great architecture. And this is on Crete and this is on mainland Greece. Uh, But specifically speaking of Crete, Here they built, the Minoans built lavish palaces, and the most notable was in the the city of uh, Knossos. Uh, That was uh, a city, uh, but also there was a palace there called uh, the Palace of Knossos. Uh, Knossos, uh, the city, uh, the ruins are still there, and in the ruins are uh, fresco paintings, and fresco is where they paint the wet... Clay, So they put wet clay on the wall, and then they paint it with pigment, and then it dries. The paint, the paint and the clay dry together, and that's called a fresco painting. Uh, Fresco's paintings uh, there in the city depict the Minoans at work and at play, and those are preserved for us. We can see what they did. Uh, but Knossos was the nerve center of Minoan society. That's important for you to know. It's the nerve center of Minoan society. Because it's where the rulers were at. They resided there. They had storehouses there. And it was a tax collection center. So that's where the wealth came into. So this was a main city. But unfortunately for them, 1628 BC, a devastating earthquake came in and destroyed, uh, basically destroyed the city. But that didn't uh, didn't stop them Um they rebuilt the city with luxurious complexes and palaces and buildings. They had running water, they had plumbing, and they even had flushing toilets. This is the pre-Greek civilization of the Minoans. So here's a picture of, of uh, Crete. And you can see here on the, on the map... Uh, here, here's Knossos uh, right there. Now here's a picture of King Minos, and um, you can definitely see the Greek influence to that statue. Here's a Minoan palace, some ruins of it. This is in Knossos. And here's a luxurious Minoan toilet. Um, looks, uh, looks pretty luxurious there. Kind of a wide uh, throne to sit on and 
Uh, you can see how you flush the toilet. The picture there shows that uh, probably a slave would come by with a bucket of water and uh, dump it down the, the crack under the toilet and it would take everything away uh, down some kind of a pipe system out of the area. So that's their luxurious Minoan flushing toilet. Okay, the next section that we're going to look at here is the development of Greek language. We will come back to uh, the Minoans here just in a little bit, uh, but the development of the Greek language. The Minoans, uh, they began to move from Crete over to mainland, uh, to the mainland, which was Greece. Uh, the people on the mainland, this is important to know, uh, were called the Mycenaeans. So you have the Minoans and the Mycenaeans. The Minoans had a script that we call Linear A, and they brought it with them from Crete over to the mainland. The Mycenaeans merged Linear A with their script, which we call Linear B. So Linear A and Linear B equals the Greek language. The Minoans and the Mycene Mycenaeans, they begin to intermarry and the civilization becomes what we call today as the Greeks. Uh, two surviving Greek works um, in the ancient Greek language are by Homer. Uh, you may have heard of these, Homer's Iliad and Homer's Odyssey. Those are two separate works, Iliad, and then number two is Odyssey. Um, and they are both about the Trojan War. The Iliad is a Greek perspective of the Trojan War. And here's uh, two pictures there of Linear A and Linear B. And you merge these together and they came up with the Greek alphabet. The Greek language. This one here, I'm not sure they have a question mark. Um, I'm not sure if that means question mark, they don't know what that symbol is, or if that symbol means a question mark. But you can see uh, here this, this alphabet language that they had that they merged together and it became the beginnings of the Greek language. Okay, so here's an ancient Greek map, and I just wanted to show you on here um, what we're talking about. So here's, here's Crete uh, down here, the bottom of the map. And then obviously you probably recognize up here, this is, this is Greece. This is Greece up here. And over here would be modern day uh, Turkey. Okay, and here's some Turkey up here, and this is... Uh, this is the strait that goes up into the Black Sea, up towards Russia. Uh, this little peninsula here is called the Gallipoli Peninsula. There was a very famous battle during World War I fought here with the British, the Australians, and the New, Zealand's, New Zealanders uh, landed here on the tip called Gallipoli, and they fought against the Turks, and they did not do very well. The, the British... Australians and New Zealanders uh, pretty much got stuck there, and then about four months later, they left, and the Turks basically won. So on this map, you will see here, we see Athens, we see um, right there it is, there's my mouse, uh, we see Sparta, let me go back. We see Sparta right there, um, Athens, and um, up here, there's Troy. Uh, we see Ephesus. Okay, so you can just take a look there at that map. This has, the map is of religious sanctuaries. I'm not concerned about the religious sanctuaries. I was just more concerned about the map. Okay, so now we're going to look at um, 
what we call the uh, the ancient Greeks. They became very advanced and uh, fairly quickly, and they were became a very advanced civilization, and they developed into many city states that we call polis. Polis, P-O-L-I-S. That's important for you to know. What happened was the people began to collect, and it, the polis began as a citadel for the people to flee to in case of uh, foreign invasion. But what happened was around this citadel, around this little area where they would collect uh, this polis, a large population is developed, and that became a commerce center and became urbanized, which basically became a city or a city-state. And this is what would, be, would be where the... Um, the taxes and agriculture will be collected for support of the populations. And this is where the, the ruler would be for that city-state. And they were ruled by an oligarch. And an oligarch means a ruler of a group of people within a mass of peoples. So an oligarch rules an oligarchy. And the... So the many different oligarchies are all the same people group, but they're ruled by different oligarchs. So it's kind of like the city-states are ruled by a maybe a local king or a local ruler. Within the polis system, uh, there were three types of people that made up the polis. And this is basically the, um, not the uh, kind of like the caste system or the the levels within the society. Um, you had the adult male citizens were on on the top, and these were the wealthy people. These were the landowners, um, free adult male citizens. They were on top. Then you had the free peoples, which were the women, children, and foreigners. And then below them were the slaves, and they were uh, either enslaved through debt, like they would sell themselves, like a bond servant, they would sell themselves into um, slavery uh, to pay off their debt, and then when their debt was paid off over a certain amount of time, then they would be free again, or they were slaves because they were captured in war. So these are the three people groups within a polis, and then the two main cities, uh, Athens and and Sparta. Now this is very interesting. This is a unique society in ancient Greece because they had no private life or individualism. That was not part of their society. Basically what happened was the status in a Greek polis made the person a human. This was very important. You For the let's just say for the man or mankind, for the, the person to be even looked at as having any kind of rights of any kind, they had to belong within the Greek polis, within the collective. The Athenians, that means in Athens, the city-state of Athens, they had absolutely no interest in individual rights. They were only concerned about the rights of the collective. So if somebody was within that, the collective society, then they had some kind of rights. But if they weren't in that collective society, then they had no rights at all. So if you took somebody from ancient Greece and you brought them to 21st century Memphis, Tennessee, or where you're at, they would be completely confused. They would have no idea what's going on. Because in our society today, we have an individual idea, an individual egocentric. It's about us individually with individual rights. You can't violate my rights, all of that kind of idea. They would find this incomprehensible because there were no individual rights like that. It was the rights of the society or the rights of the collective together. That's what gave the rights. That's where the rights were and you belonging to part of that. There was no like individual kind of kind of rights. Here's a picture of a Greek polis. You can see the structure of it there, the urban area 
um, was usually protected by a defensive wall so that the people could go there to have protection. Part of it was elevated. Usually these were built around some sort of a mount, and so it was elevated. A temple would be up on the mount. Uh, the mount, the Acropolis was the uh, elevated part, and then the, uh, the temple there on top of it. And then you can see in the, in the background there, the farmland, that was dependent territory located outside of the city walls, which was used for farming. So the agriculture would feed the polis. And the people would live either on the farms and serve out in the farms and farmlands, or they would live within the polis itself. And you can see there was an arena, there's an amphitheater, uh, other palaces. So you can see the different um, structures of the polis. And here's a picture of uh, Athens. This is a Greek polis. Uh, Athens. That's a pretty well-known picture there. Okay, now we're going to move into Classical Greek. We're still going to come back to the Minoans and Mycenaeans in just in a second, but we're going to move into Classical Greek, 800 to 350 B.C. And we're going to go through a couple of uh, uh, cities, and we're going to go through some um, features of their architecture. So the first city we're going to look at is Ephesus. This is near Patmos, and you may recall Patmos is where John was uh, banished to the island of Patmos, but Ephesus is the city, um, important seaport. It, uh, had a, it was a major agricultural, commercial, and religious center. It was called the Supreme Metropolis of Asia. Ephesus, the Supreme Metropolis of Asia. There were four trade routes that moved through this city, so definitely people were coming and going, and wealth came into the city. There were two temples that were in the city, the temple to Artemis and the temple to Diana. And uh, just one of note, uh, Temple of Diana was one of seven, the seven wonders of the ancient world. And the problem is, is that the worship of Diana, uh, Diana um, involved s serious religious immorality. It was at its worst, and this would be just complete debauchery would be going on within this temple with uh, temple prostitutes and uh, sexual immorality. They would um, uh, go there and have sexual immorality uh, to worship Diana in, uh, in their false religion. Now, the New Testament, I know that's outside the time period at the top of the slide, but the New Testament says much about Ephesus and to the church at Ephesus. And so you can see those names on the bottom, Paul, Timothy, Tychicus, John, Aquila, Priscilla, Apollos. Uh, there should be a comma after Priscilla. Uh, Apollos. These were uh, names in the New Testament who are affiliated with the church at Ephesus. Okay, we're going to fly through these real quick. Philippi, again, you know that one, the book of Philippians, uh, written to the church at Philippi in the New Testament. Uh, this is in eastern Macedonia. It sits along a military and commercial highway called the Via Ignatia, which basically means the Ignatian Way. Chief Mining Center was located here, and they mined for gold. And this, this uh, city was visited by Paul during his second missionary journey. The next city, Thessalonica. You know that city also because of the books of First and Second Thessalonians. This city was named after the stepsister of Alexander the Great. And uh, obviously Paul wrote two letters to that church in Thessalonica. The next three terms there on the screen are um, architectural features. Uh, first is the Parthenon. This um, was to the temple. This was a temple uh, for the goddess Athena. This is in Athens, Greece, the Parthenon. The next architectural feature is the Caryatid. And this was an architectural column made out of a figure of a woman, a carotid. 
And then the amphitheater. Uh, this was an open-air theater where Greeks would watch plays. All right, so just a couple pictures. Uh, this is the Parthenon, very famous. You probably recognize that from pictures. This is in Athens, which we saw. Just go back to that, that map. of You can see it right there on the top, right up here. Okay, there it is. Okay, so here is a keratid. And these are pillars that are carved out of stone, and uh, they're in the figure of a woman. A unique thing about these was they were used mainly to um, support the roofs of the treasury buildings within the different polis areas. And here's an amphitheater, and this is uh, pretty impressive in size. It's obviously a ruin. It's built usually into the side of a mountain, uh, so they can use the side of the mountain to, or a hill, whatever you want to call it, uh, to support the seating for all the people. Very steep uh, seating. And they would stand down there on the stage and talk, and it would be able to go, and most people would be able to hear everything that was said. Very good acoustics. Okay, so just for a, a few minutes, I want to um, just run down through some notes. Uh, we're going to get back to the Minoan and the Mycenaean uh, society to lead us up to the Trojan War. So this is like background information. Uh, if you want to take notes, please go ahead and do so. And I'll just leave this picture here of SpongeBob in his toga um, up there on the screen as I go through uh, some notes here, some recap. Remember, the Minoan society was on the island of Crete. They had lavish palaces, and most notable is Knossos. Um, they had storehouses there. They had uh, tax collection centers there. It was named for the legendary king Minos. It was a maritime trade center. They would go from there and trade and sail to different parts of Greece and Phoenicia and Egypt. And they would bring in exports, uh, take exports out and bring imports in, exports of wine, olive oil, and wool, importing in grains and textiles, manufactured goods. And then we also talked about... Uh, the language that was developed when the Minoans and the Mycenaeans uh, came together on the mainland of Greece. Minoan, uh, Minoan society had uh, natural disasters such as volcanoes and all of that, but earthquakes were definitely a, a main uh, geological activity. And as I said, in 1628, they had a, a very destructive time and they had to rebuild. And what happened was Crete ended up falling to foreign invaders. Most historians believe that a tsunami kind of hit the island and flooded some areas of the island, and they were recovering from that, but then they were weak. It was like in a weakened state because of this natural disaster, and some different people groups came in and invaded And um, basically, Crete would, would fall to foreign invaders. But remember, the people had moved from Crete over to the mainland, and they mixed with the Mycenaean uh, society. These, this is, these are the people that came over from Crete to, Mycenae, to, to mainland Greece. They married into the Mycenaeans, and they developed the Greek peoples, the Greek language. Um, linear A, linear B comes together. And they would engage in the conflict with the city of Troy, um, which we call the Trojan War. So 
I'm going to give you some details now about the Mycenaean civilization, which was on mainland Greek. So uh, Minoans were on Crete. Mycenaeans are on mainland Greece. And so around the year 2000 BC, uh, people were settling in um, an area called Peloponnesus, which is in Greece, and and they were settling in there. Uh, they began to trade with the island of Crete. They learned um, about large-scale construction from the Minoans on Crete. And they would build massive stone fortresses along the southern part of Greece. Their major settlement was Mycenae. And obviously their civilization was called the Mycenaeans. It was a fortified citadel with a beautiful palace. And when this was uh, discovered, the archaeologists found five golden burial masks uh, within uh, the city. They began to develop a military in Mycenae. And they would use logistics to be able to move out and defend and conquer other areas around. Their military, the Mycenaean military, they had heavy infantry with spears and large shields and some armor. And spears were the weapon of choice because they were long. They were able to use two hands on them. Some of them were more than 10 feet long. Uh, shields were the size of the, the soldier's body, a very tall shield that they could kind of put together to make a wall. Uh, but for the infantry to move a little faster, they also had circular hand shields. They had helmets, and the helmets would have uh, boar tusks on them to reinforce them. And so they actually kind of developed into a pretty militaristic society, the Mycenaeans. And that's going to lead us now into the Trojan War. So uh, thank you for listening to that um, bit of lecture material, just to move through some of that pretty quickly. And now we're going to leave SpongeBob, and we are going to go to the Trojan War. 1200 BC, it's Troy versus the Mycenaean Greeks. And this was uh, inspired, has inspired great writers in antiquity. They have many people have written about the Trojan War. And there's different legends about it with the Trojan horse. And even movies have been made not too long ago about the Trojan War. But basically it started over the abduction and some believe the elopement of Queen Helen of Sparta uh, by Trojan Prince Paris. And Homer's Iliad and Odyssey uh, detail this. The jilted husband of Queen Helen, his name is Menelaus, he convinces his brother Agamemnon who was king of Mycenae, uh, to go retrieve her. And we see Iliad, uh, Homer's Iliad uh, tells of, of this. And you probably he he heard of characters such as Achilles and Helen and Hector and other heroes beginning to merge in with Greek mythology. And then... The final year of the Greek siege of, of Troy. But then Homer also wrote Odyssey. And this is an epic poem in 24 books, traditionally attributed to, um, to Homer. Uh, the poem is the story of Odysseus, who is the king of Ithaca, who wanders for 10 years trying to get home after the Trojan War. On his return, he is recognized only by his faithful dog, 
and a nurse, and with the help of his son, Telemachus, Odysseus destroys the insistent suitors of his faithful wife, Penelope, and several of her handmaids who had fraternized fraternized with the suitors and reestablish himself in his kingdom. So there's a quick synopsis of the Odyssey. You don't need to know uh, any of that information for an exam, but just to let you know what that's all about. But anyway, um, this leads into several centuries of turmoil, political turmoil, 1100 to 800 BC, uh, invasions, uh, poor crops, population decline, people abandon settlements, so it's going to take us to 800 uh, BC. And that's going to be it for our uh, lecture here uh, today. I'll see you just in a second. Okay, class, that's good enough for today. I hope you guys were able to take some good notes and learn some new things about uh, ancient Greece. Um, continue on with the readings that are on the syllabus. And you'll see that also in Moodle. Uh, continue to ch do that checklist in, uh, in Moodle for the online students. Do the checklist. And, uh, and again, you're not graded on that checklist. It's just uh, something that helps, uh, helps me and maybe helps you uh, see what you have due for the week. And when you ch check it off, then, then it's all done. Uh, so uh, continue on in with the reading and the things that are on uh, Moodle. Uh, other than that, I will see you in the next lecture. Take care.